All right, so this is going to be super low effort, but basically what I wanted to do here was say thank you to all 1,000 of you that have subscribed. I'm very happy to have finally reached that significant milestone. I will say it's a little bit frustrating because we went from zero to 500 in what felt like practically overnight for the channel, but then going from 500 to 1,000 took several years, which was very discouraging for quite a while, but I think I'm right on track with videos that I'm really happy about putting a lot of effort into. And I think they are resonating with a lot of people. And I have a lot more of those videos planned, as you guys are going to find out over the course of this video. So the purpose of this video, what I wanted to do was just kind of tell my story. So tell the origins of why I wanted to start making videos and what what's next from here. What am I making in the future? And kind of align every project that I've touched or put my hands on so that you can find all the information in one central place here in this video because there are people jumping on the channel from different points in time and different videos and don't really know how I got to this point. Not that they necessarily really care, but you'll see what I mean as I, as I get into it. So my origins in wanting to be a video creator go back as far as 2003 when I got my very first camera um, basically as a kid and this thing was a I think it was a Panasonic and it took little as little uh, SD cards which were like 200 megabyte SD cards at the time and it was a little camera I kid you not a little square I probably still have it somewhere a little camera like this big with a little flip up screen and it took like just awful potato quality video and I was just recording random stuff with that as a kid I would record you know random wildlife or like our pet dog just doing silly stuff and i remember uh, my brother and i trying to make like goofy little fan films with that with stuff like like legos or with the uh with the bionicle line like current whatever current storyline was going on at that point in the comics and that was a lot of fun but it was it was kid stuff you know but it still kind of like sparked that creative interest in me and in wanting to make videos and then in it was really like 2007 i want to say when i first kind of discovered youtube and started up uh, wanting to upload there and i the very first things i started uploading to youtube were um stop motion animations and like toy review kind of videos back in the day and none of those none of those exist anymore they're all completely gone they've been they have been for years because you got to imagine i was like a teenager at the time so they were all terrible but when i started upgrading to better cameras and the way that they handled file storage stop motion animation was actually possible and so I was doing that for a while and there was actually a really sizable very humble audience for that back in like 2007 2008 I was just I guess embarrassed by that I didn't I didn't like those videos anymore I was as I was getting older I thought they were super cringe and so I deleted all that stuff and went through a different direction with my original channel uh, which was to start doing more video game based content, let's plays and things like that. And it's crazy to think that in late 2009, when I started doing that, the let's plays were still already pretty popular back then, but they weren't what we know them to be today. So my inspirations for let's plays back then was like, I remember earlier that same year, like in the summer when I first got my Xbox 360 and was playing through games like like the first Halo for the first time, for instance, I remember the uh, like forumsextreme.com Halo walkthrough and how it was a it was a commentary track over gameplay done in post that was very 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 thorough and it went through like specific strategies at specific moments on Legendary and I had to I had to use that walkthrough to get unstuck from the 343 Guilty Spark level. Those of you who play the game know what I'm talking about, where it kind of there's a lot of rooms that are copy and pasted, and it looks, it looks uh, it's difficult to figure out where you're supposed to go. And so I, I found that walkthrough for that. But I just thought the, the presentation of that was very professional and was super cool from somebody that clearly had a lot of experience with the game and was able to speak to it very intelligently and help other people through the game. So I really like that sort of video walkthrough style. The term Let's Play had probably been coined at this time, but not a lot of people really used it. But then you had, on the other side, people like H.C. Uh, Bailey, who still does Let's Plays to this day. And please, for the love of God, if you like JRPGs, go subscribe to him, because he is like this close to reaching 100,000 subscribers, and I please want him to reach that before he retires, because his videos are incredible. He is one of the most thorough 
less players out there. Like his commentary is done live, so it has more of that improv cadence to it. Like he's like you know reacting live to things happening in the game. But he will do sometimes three or four test runs of a game before doing a let's play. It just has this this level of thoroughness where you can you know that like every single stone has been overturned with a very long game with his Let's Plays. And I, that was a big inspiration for me as well. Um, but I was doing Let's Plays from, like I said, late 2009 up until about 2015, 2016, I want to say. And I was having fun making them, but they were they were just a little side project that took up a, a bit of my free time. But nobody really watched those videos. They I would be lucky if they got like double-digit views and... Uh, so it was mostly for me. I, I like to think that there were people watching them, or maybe even one or two loyal commenters. Um, but it was it was kind of fruitless, and it, it got boring after a while for that reason. But there were a couple of games that I did that uh, did g- gather a bit of a following, and it was the the biggest one was the um, the Zoids Battle Legends game for the GameCube because that was a more niche, obscure, you know, anime game that not a lot of other people had done Let's Plays for. It wasn't something super mainstream that sold millions of copies. There was an audience for it because, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of other competing people playing the game. It was it was just me and like a small handful of others. And so those Let's Play videos were getting thousands of not ten thousands of views. And that sort of spiraled into this this falling back in love with the Zoids brand again, which caused me to track down uh, the Japanese uh, sequel and prequel to that game, because that game is the second game in a trilogy, and playing and doing the Let's Plays for those, which were also pretty popular. And there was a couple other good Let's Plays I made around that 2015-2016 era. Like, uh, I went through Sengoku Basura, I went through Gungrave and Gungrave Overdose. Those were all pretty well received. And I think on my, on my old channel, the... Uh, some of the Bossra videos, the first Gungrave video, and the, some of the Zoids Battle Legends videos are still um, in like the high tens of thousands of views over on on that channel. But uh, I, you know, me and Michelle started dating in 2016, and she uh, was watching some of my Let's Plays and liked what I did and wanted to kind of get involved. So we thought, you know, there's some games that we want to play together. There's some games we may want to stream together and, and you know, maybe a game that she was familiar with that she wanted me to experience for the first time kind of live with her. So we uh, streamed Danganronpa 2, and it was my first, you know, blind run through the game. It was something I, I was very uncharacteristic of the style of video of, of a Let's Play I would have done prior to that. And we had a great time doing that. And only some of the episodes were streamed live. Some of them were pre-recorded, but we still it was still like a, a blind let's play with live commentary kind of situation. And so we had such a good time doing that that we decided that it might be time to rebrand and do a new channel because I was getting into a little bit of a predicament where I was uploading so much varied content to the main channel that it was probably creating viewer whiplash. So I was making videos, I was making the Let's Play videos, I was making the Zoids model kit videos because the there was a, there was an audience for Zoids, and I was making videos about like the Yu-Gi-Oh TCG, and all that stuff had its audiences, but it all kind of conflicted with each other, and I didn't want to create this like subscriber whiplash. So that's where that's where Starcross Souls started. So we made the channel in, I think, early 2018. We started just kind of doing more gaming content on there. And a lot of it was was basically a flop. I mean, you got to think, if if the Let's Play videos were already not getting a lot of views back in, like, 2009, 2010, they definitely were not going to get any views in 2018, and especially not now. And it's weird how YouTube has kind of reprioritized the algorithm to sort of disincentivize uh, Let's Plays. And that most Let's Play channels are just automatically dead in the water. Um, I don't know what the exact reason is behind that. But, like, occasionally you'll have some random video with, like, 27 views recommended to you on your on your uh, recommended page. And you're just like, man, no, nobody's watching these. Like, what what is going on? But um, I, I think that the problem with that might have been quantity over quality with let's plays for many years and so people just kind of stopped watching anyone other than their their top 1% people 
people that they already followed. Even though, and I'm sure I made some terrible videos in that era too, but I was pretty proud of them for a while in terms of the quality of the commentary versus other people that were doing them. But I digress. We started Starcross Souls, and it was supposed to be just a collaborative channel that me and her would make videos on together. And uh, that changed a lot over the next couple of years because in 2019, my you know, real world job changed significantly where I adopted a bunch of new responsibilities and a significant pay raise that resulted in me having uh, significantly less in terms of free time. And um, we weren't playing as many games together. We didn't live together yet at the time. The games that she were playing, that she was playing were different kinds of games. And so we had all these lofty ideas for things we wanted to do for the channel and it just never, it just never really took off. Um, But I had these ideas in the back of my head and it was, I was thinking about the towards right before the rebrand on the old channel, I was making these videos, these like video essay type videos about Sengoku Basara and uh, they were not particularly good. They were very cringe and I was taking inspiration from content creators that were not good good to be taking inspiration from in my opinion now like i i've have i have different tastes in the type of content creators that i take inspiration from but i was you know kind of complaining on on facebook i was like you know should i continue making these videos should i not continue making these videos should i make something else and um my friend coulter uh who was a bossra fan um is who is no longer with us unfortunately um he told me he's like well why don't you just start making videos about the fate series because that's at the time more relevant and topical it's kind of mainstream right now even and you seem to like that franchise a lot so you'd, be, you'd probably be better off doing that than talking about bossro which has been dead and dormant for a long time at this point like nearly a decade there's more of an audience for that and so um i did that and the um the thoughts i had in the back of my head was you know I would have the, like the the shower thoughts, how everybody gets into like deep thoughts in the shower, and I had these like vivid visions for what a like long form video essay type series about the different fate properties would be like. Particularly, I was thinking about the 2006 Studio Dean Fate Stay Night anime and a bunch of moments that happened in that, and a bunch of talking about its its reputation, you know, its mixed reputation among the fans. And certain elements of the of the storytelling that are either intentionally or unintentionally subtle in the way that they hint at the other routes and all that kind of stuff. And I was just thinking about all that in my head in the shower and having this really ambitious idea for this video essay. And I was thinking back to like, you know, in 2008 or whatever, you know, you had like the Channel Awesome people and you had like Mars Girl, who I know does not want to be associated with them anymore. But um, she was making like this multi-part in-depth retrospective of Trigun and talking about like little nuanced things within the episodes like when Vash is like talking to the plant after the whole train arc thing and you know I just thought about that like I I really want to do like this long form extremely deep breakdown of the of the Type Moon anime of, of the different fate works and um, so I started making those. And of course, those were the, the original video essays on this channel where I really started to kind of solidify an identity with this channel. And I started making those and they started getting better, more better production quality as the as the series went on. Although I think some of my some of my arguments for and some of my my level of depth about the videos holds up better than the production quality did because the production quality had a lot of opportunity there for a lot of those because I was just I was just learning I was figuring it out so um, lighting camera resolution audio uh, audio editing all that stuff had a lot of room for improvement it probably still has room for improvement to this day but we'll talk about that and uh, some of those I'm still pretty proud of some of them I think are kind of cringy but some of them I'm still pretty proud of particularly I think the fate zero and Unlimited Blade Works ones I'm very proud of. and But I kind of already knew after that what the next um, video essay, like, series retrospective things were going to be. Um, and I didn't expect the Type Moon one to kind of end how it did, and, and we'll talk about that. But a lot of my inspirations for 
the modern style of videos that I make now is just kind of the the content creators that I discovered around like you know 2018 2019 up until now and you know I'm really making the types of content that I like to watch so I love watching you know if it's a gaming youtuber it's somebody like Klimps or it's somebody like um uh, Kbash or uh, Super Eye Patch Wolf is, is one of my favorites. And then the other video essayist type people is like your knowing better, your Dan Olson, your H Bomber guy type people. And so they're they're definitely my inspirations. And I think there's a certain style that they have that is professional and humble and worth taking a worth taking a lesson from because I would rather watch their content than somebody who's like, yo, make sure to smash the subscribe button, smash the like button, and all this stuff. And um, it's just over the top, in your face with the editing, you know, smooth transitions, cinematic ca- camera angles, and the, the go-to, like, bisexual lighting in the background and stuff like that. Like, none of that stuff interests me. And I think it is... I've, I've realized that the way that I watch YouTube content is heavily cultivated by the fact that I make content. And so certain things that are just like, you know, lowest common denominator, like the YouTube style or are, you know, growth hacks for dummies kind of things. They're very transparent to me as somebody that watches a lot of content and makes a lot of content. And they just rub me the wrong way whenever I see them. And so I particularly gravitate towards videos that are, that don't have that. And the, the, a lot of the people I just mentioned are, um, in my opinion, are, are kind of above that. And maybe it's because they already have an existing following or maybe it's because they they want to maintain this sort of degree of professionalism to them and they don't. They also are kind of self-aware about the, the YouTube style. I don't, again, I don't have the best production quality in the world and it will probably take me years and years of doing this to be able to afford good, better equipment to have good production quality and lots of practice and everything. But even then I still don't think I'll be doing like crazy fancy edits or cinematic transitions or have bisexual lighting in the background of the video. It's just not what I want to do. The whole thing has been a huge learning experience, just figuring out what works and what doesn't in terms of whether it's script writing or it's recording or it's lighting or it's equipment or it's editing or it's audio editing. Um, People are massive, massive audio snobs, I have learned, and if something is distasteful in the audio with a video, they will bounce right off of it regardless of the merit of the rest of the video, which is deeply frustrating. So I've tried to upgrade the microphone attachment to my camera itself, and I have now a pretty high quality uh, XLR microphone. Again, this is going from like starting out with the channel it was like a blue snow, a blue snowball uh, USB to like a blue Yeti USB, and then there was another XLR microphone I had up until getting this thing. And the Dark of the Moon video was the first uh, main channel video essay to use this. And this is, of course, a uh, you can't really see it because it's in the shadow of my shirt, but it's the the Shure SM7DB, and so it's the highest quality microphone I've ever had, and I hope it shows. I'm very much still trying to get used to what kind of settings, what kind of secondary programs, what kind of secondary equipment I need to make it sound good and professional. And any feedback you guys have on that, like if you think that it it sounds weird and you know of a very specific way that I can fix that, let me know. I also alternated the positioning of it and the way that I recorded the audio between the Dark of the Moon video and the Fist of the North Star video. So with the... With the... Dark of the Moon video, it hung down like this. It uh, hung, hung down like in this orientation, and I spoke directly into it like this. And then the for the Fist of North Star video, it was upright like this, and I just spoke into it from about this far away. And I've watched tutorials, and I've watched various different things online, and those are the types of varying setups people recommend to do. And of course, right now, the in order for me to be in front of the cam, the camera built into the computer and to have the mic in front of me it's at this weird angle i'm sure it doesn't sound great but this is also a low effort video so it is what it is but i'm also using like audacity and going into the each individual audio recording and manually 
trimming down the space between breaths, muting breaths, muting all the sounds out and like cleaning up the audio a ton in post. And it's adding a lot of extra time to the editing, but I will not tolerate (laughs) comments about the audio quality anymore because I I put a lot of money and a lot of time into addressing that. And, you know, it is, of course, it is an ongoing thing, but it's like, um, you know, I I am taking it extremely seriously at this point and and I'm putting a lot of effort in post into editing the sound of the commentary and trying to make it sound as professional as possible. But um, I digress. The, like I said, it's all, it's all learning process. I haven't had as much practice and as much experience as I would like because the turnout of videos has been very, very slow. Um, Part of that was COVID. Again, the job that I had that allowed me to buy my house and for my wife and I to get married in 2020 was very time consuming and very strenuous. And so there there wasn't a whole lot of time for making videos around that time, whether it was the writing or the recording or the editing or whatever. And so it took a while to be able to get back into the groove of things. And I feel like this year is the first time that I have truly been able to get into a groove. And right now I'm on track of like on, on average one video a month for this year, which is pretty cool. And I don't think I will be able to keep that up for the entire year, but I will go ahead and talk about the next projects that I have lined up. So what's, what's next for the channel? What, what other products do I have lined up? And this is the part that I think most people will be curious about because it will put into clarity a lot of uh, questions people may have about the future games and the individual ongoing retrospective series, but also other miscellaneous projects that I want to do eventually that you guys don't know about because I've never spoken about them before in a video. You guys may find that interesting. Who knows? So I want to do a unscripted follow-up to the cosplay video in this exact format you're seeing right here where I have just a couple of notes of topics I wanted to further unpack from that video and other topics people have suggested to me, um, such as how one of them was how the rise of TikTok has created this comorbid, like fast fashion industry with cosplay where like Gen Z kids are encouraged to just buy and dispose of cheap pre-made cosplays to keep up with trends So stuff like that I want to talk about in that little side video. Um, Some people ask if the Type Moon retrospective is continuing or if it is done. And to kind of unpack what happened there, um, you may notice I haven't uploaded any anime video essays since the one-off video on the anime Freezing, which is more of a commentary on the the etchy genre as a whole, Um, but also talking about a a series I did have an attachment to. That was the final anime video. And the reason for that is that the, I made the heavens feel part one video. I made the full video essay on the, on the fate stay night, heavens feel the heavens feel the movie part one. And only like six people got to see it because it was, it wasn't just like a copyright. It wasn't just like, hey, um, this belongs to somebody else, or hey, this is blocked in certain countries, or hey, this is muted. It wasn't one of those. It was specifically like, this is a copyright takedown notice. Like, we are going to delete this entire video. And so I was like, they're clearly not playing around as it pertains to footage from this movie. And I didn't want to mangle the video in the editing booth and destroy what I had created to make something passable to upload that would have sucked anyway um so i just decided to shelve any further anime video projects and the only thing i can think of is if if one day michelle and i decide to do like a patreon or something to have the heavens feel videos and any future anime videos be patreon exclusive where maybe there's a way we can like embed them in the or some other video hosting platform, or even just a, a Google Drive link or something to be able to um, to view that video. But I was really proud of the video. It was a very good video, in my opinion, at least. And I wanted to... I still have a lot to say about the other two films, but the way that YouTube's copyright ID system works, it is so hostile towards anything about film and TV that it's just not worth it, in my opinion. I've, I've been with the amount of like movie clips and things I've used in recent videos, I've been walking a very fine line 
and uh, fighting copyright claims is probably one of any YouTuber's least favorite things in the world. And so I'm just kind of focusing on video games, which I know are safe because YouTube and, and video games have this very codependent relationship on each other. Same thing with Twitch. And so it's like YouTube wouldn't be what it is if it wasn't for uh, gaming YouTube as as much as that's, you know, as much as I wish it wasn't that way, it, it, it kind of is. So I know I'm safe as far as I'm, as long as I'm making videos about games. But really the point of all of the different series that I've done, all the different video essays that I've done is, you know, if you look at where I've taken inspiration from, it's like, yes, I want to talk about media, but I really want it to be this further discussion about, like, use it as a segue to talk about other intersecting aspects of culture and politics and values, or it's something that I just have a deep personal connection to. And so that's why, that's why Type Moon, that's why Transformers, that's why some of the other brands that you guys have seen me talk about. So the only other Type Moon videos that are guaranteed is as part of, technically as part of the Muso retrospective, is talking about Extella Link and Samurai Remnant. And I may actually do do a director's cut version of the original Extella video and edit both both parts together and make it like the full three hour video, maybe clean up the editing a little bit in the process. Because uh, splitting that video was necessary for production's sake, but nobody watched the second half at all. So like it was not worth it to me to split that into two parts. And I kind of hope that um now that so many people have subscribed for the Muso retrospective, that it's like here's here's technically a video about a Muso game that I've already made that you guys haven't watched. So go go back and watch it. And maybe the director's cut version will incentivize them to do that. If I can cut out a lot of the side stuff that kind of tied that into the rest of the Titan retrospective, so that's something I'm thinking about doing. But yeah, very excited to talk about Extel Link. I'll be talking about it pretty soon in the Muso retrospective, but probably within the next the next four or five games, probably. The next uh, Transformers videos. So the main Transformers video game retrospective is almost done. The main games I have to talk about, which will be the, the video that will be up in June, is Fall of Cybertron. Very, very, very excited to talk about this game. Uh, I've already been doing some test runs and getting some footage and taking some notes for the script. And without getting into too much of my opinion about that game right here before we get into the full video, I'm just sh I'm shocked at how long it's been since I've played it, at how much spectacle this game has. And while I don't think it's a strict one-to-one -one upgrade over War for Cybertron, it is just such a fantastic game, and I'm really looking forward to to talking about it. And the next mo the next uh, one after that is. Rise of the Dark Spark, which is a game I've not played at all. I skipped it on release, and so this will be my first time playing it as for the video. And then finally, it is Transformers Devastation, which is going to be a, a collab video between me and my my friend and channel collaborator, Caleb at Flashing Blades Productions. Um, we're planning on both this being like a crossover video where he will speak in part of it and write part of the script. He'll have his he'll have his own segments and his own opinions in it, which is gonna be pretty cool. But we may do a series of streams together where we play the game simultaneously. And uh so when we're doing those live streams of he and I both playing the game together on separate consoles to get footage, then you'll know I'll be working on the devastation video. And that that's all the Transformers videos that are guaranteed. Now beyond that I did say I wanted to go back and cover the DS games, and there's also that Wii game about the about Transformers Prime. I do want to cover all those, but I I may take a break from Transformers after Devastation and come back to those when I'm ready. And this kind of ties into where I'm at with the Muso retrospective as well, where when I first started the Muso retrospective, I had a linear format for like I wanted to cover those games in a certain order more or less the release order of those games but now that I'm doing it I just and I mentioned this in the I want to say it was in the boss or a two video where I said that 
covering them in order is a really bad idea because it will force me to talk about games that I'm not prepared to talk about early before games that I have played before. And so because the next two videos for the channel that I'm working on is the Fall of Cybertron video and the Dragon Quest Heroes video, those are two games that I'm extremely passionate about. And I think that passion will be self-evident. Whereas if you look at the runtime, if you if you compare the runtime of a video like the Extella video and the War for Cybertron video and compare those to like the Dark of the Moon video and the Fist of the North Star video, you can definitely tell that the amount of things I have to say about a topic is very relevant to how much passion I have for it. And... So the runtime is a good indicator of how mu- how much I have to say about it and how passionate I am about it. So if the video is shorter, which I was, again, disappointed by the length of the last two videos, um, it's it's a little bit more like pulling teeth to talk about it. And, and just to be transparent, it's like, I know that you, the viewer, can tell if I'm being... If, if I'm not 100% invested in what I'm talking about, it's going to show. And so I think it's best to um, not force myself to make a video about something I don't want to make a video about. And that's kind of why the Musa retrospective is taking this non-linear approach where I'm, I'm thinking I'm going, to, I'm going to cover the games that I finished and that I like first. And then over the course of... This channel, I'm planning on hopefully fixing my streaming setup where I don't have to worry about audio desync as badly. And then my first time playthrough of these other Musou games, I can stream them so that the audience can interact with them. There's probably not a lot of Musou streamers out there. And so that I can get the footage. So I can play the game, get the footage, and still kind of engage with the Musou fans some more. So the Musou retrospective is going to include, but not be limited to, um, Gundam Musou 3, or Dynasty Warriors Gundam 3, uh, Basura 3, Arslan, the Warriors of Legend, Dragon Quest Heroes, Hyrule Warriors, um, Basura 4, uh, Fire Emblem Warriors, Dragon Quest Heroes 2, Berserk and the Band of the Hawk, Fate Extel Link, Dynasty Warriors 8, Dynasty Warriors 8 Extreme Legends, um, Sengoku Basura 4 Sumeragi Anniversary Edition, Persona 5 Strikers, Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity, Fire, Fire Emblem Warriors 3 Hopes, um, Dynasty Warriors Next, Warriors All-Stars, and uh, Toku Eden. Um, there's also like Basura, Sanada Yukimura Den. Um, there's a lot. I think I actually need to add um, Warriors All-Stars to the list. Um, so immediately right now, like I said, the, the very next one is Dragon Quest Heroes. And the one after that is probably going to be either Berserk or Fire Emblem. And hopefully by that time, I'll be playing more of these other Musou games casually. But those are the ones that I have I have committed to. Those are the ones I own and the ones I've committed to for a video. But like talking about like Hyrule Warriors or Gundam Musou 3, for instance, those franchises are so beloved and they are such a deep rabbit hole that there's nothing that's not going to make me feel unprepared to talk about them. Um, they, they they are so monolithic that it's going... To, and I, I you know, am historically not that big of a Zelda fan. I didn't grow up with a Nintendo console, so I'm not a huge Zelda fan. So there's nothing that's not going to make me feel completely unprepared to talk about Hyrule, Hyrule Warriors. And so I'd much rather talk about, like I said, the Dragon Quest one, the Berserk one, the Fire Emblem one before I do that. But I'm definitely looking forward to some of the later um, Musou videos for sure. Um, As far as the Yasuhiro Naitao retrospective, so this one is less of of a Naitao retrospective at this point and more of a Gungrave retrospective. And the problem with that, like I said, was the ability to talk about anime. Originally, the retrospective was supposed to be the Trigun anime, the first Gungrave game, the Gungrave anime, the second Gungrave game, the Trigun movie, Blood Blockade Season 1, Blood Blockade Season 2, and then Gungrave Gore to finish the whole thing off. But now it's just looking like a trilogy of videos about Gungrave. Gungrave Overdose video has been in production, but what I am... I almost had the ability to record the footage off of a backwards-compatible PS3 which would have made the 
PS2 footage exponentially better because it would have been through HDMI. So I, I postponed working on it for a while to see if I could have recorded the game through that method, and that method didn't pan out. So I'm kind of in between the early parts of the production with the Gungrave Gore video. No, I'm sorry, with the Gungrave Overdose video. And I don't know exactly when I will be finishing that. Um, but yeah, the Night Owl videos are just going to be the three Gungrave games and that's it. Those of you who watched my RPG accessibility video, uh, one of my favorite videos I've ever made, you may remember I teased a video about Val Valkyria Chronicles at the end of that video, and I still do want to make that. I'm not exactly sure when I will be working on that because that is a game that I plan on going through as a dedicated uh, video game night game with my wife and our best friend. Um, and so I don't know when I'm going to be able to, you know, replay it again casually after that to do the video, but I'll probably be taking notes for the script um, while we do that cooperative game night game session. And uh, so hopefully, you know, t to be determined with the Valkyria Chronicles video, I will make it, but I have no commitment as to when or how. After I finish the Transformers retrospective and the Muso one, the one of the other retrospective style series that I wanted to do is one on Insomniac Games. And I have thought a lot about this. I'm still not 100% committed to the idea. If I do, it will be after one of these other series has been completely finished. But I really want to do an Insomniac retrospective, and that will basically include talking about... First, we'll talk about Disruptor on the PS1, which is a, a boomer shooter that not a lot of these other boomer shooter creators get to talk about because it's on the PS1 and not on PC. And uh, then we'll be able to talk about the Spyro games. We'll be able to talk about the Ratchet & Clank games. We'll be able to talk about Resistance, and I get to talk about how much I hate Resistance 2 and love Resistance 3 and Resistance Burning Skies on the Vita, which I just finished this year, is a great game. Um, we'll be able to talk about Sunset Overdrive, which is a game I really, really want to finish. We'll be able to talk about Fuse, which is a game that a lot of people hate on for having misleading advertising, but have never actually played it, and it's actually a really good game. And then we would end that with the... PS4 Spider-Man game, I guess. A, a game I feel pretty unprepared to talk about because I'm not you know, a huge comic book guy or anything, but I do like Spider-Man a lot, and I'm looking forward to playing that game. But it would mainly just be, you know... I, I want to talk about Insomniac's older games a lot more than I want to talk about that game, but that would be in the inevitable end point of that retrospective. Um, I also want to do a retrospective series on different Yu-Gi-Oh! video game adaptations. Lots of people are talking about Forbidden Memories right now, as it has this sort of cult following right now. But I want to talk about what it was like to beat Forbidden Memories legitimately as a kid without you know any kind of 15 mod, a 15 card mod or anything like that, and and what a brutal grind that was. But I also have this really I have this really good idea for a video about Duels of the Roses where I want to, I don't want to spoil this for you, but I have this dumb idea for this skit where it's like, you know, maybe I'll have, I'll be in like a fancy suit with like um, rose petals and books about the Tudors and the War of the Roses all around, which I have those books and I'm in the process of wanting to read them for this video. And um, maybe some candlelight, maybe I'll set the video in black and white or something like that. And just be like, you know, let me tell you a story about the Tudors and the War of the Roses and like go into this like historical explanation for like five minutes and then just be like, oh, yeah. And then they made a video game uh, about ch a children's card game from Japan that has characters from ancient Egypt in it and just like do the whole like vinyl scratch like Wah! and just like segue into the rest of the video with that really pretentious intro. Um, and uh the video itself, I, you know, talking about each of the different decks you can start with and, you know, a viable route through the game with each of those, I think is there's a lot of potential in that. And I'm really excited to talk about that. But the unfortunate thing about doing a retrospective on those is that all of the other games after that will not be nearly as interesting of a video. Like I can talk about the unique meta game of something like 5D's Decade Duels on the Xbox 360 and PS3, 
but like it's not going to be nearly as interesting as talking about Duels of the Roses. So I still want to do that retrospective, but I'm unsure as to how many videos that will that will take up. Um, something I wish I could do, but I unfortunately feel a lot of imposter syndrome with, is I wish I could do a retrospective on all of the games that use id software tech, id tech. So that would be not only like the Doom and Quake games, but other games that use them, like, you know, Star Trek Voyager Elite Force and stuff like that. But I think where I have found where I have found a happy middle ground is um, I want to do a video called In Defense of Rage. And what this would be essentially is a, as the name would suggest, like a defense of the video game Rage and how it's not nearly as bad as a lot of people say it is. It's not a masterpiece or anything, but it's way better than what most people say it is. And most people are like, oh, it's boring and blah, blah, blah. It's absolutely not. And it's actually um, has a lot more to it than um, it gets unfairly labeled as. And then the same thing with uh, I would do another one for Rage 2. And so uh, that is a video that I know some people will appreciate because I do hear amongst all the outrage merchants, people that do like those games. Uh, I even had a friend that was a QA tester for Rage 2, and she had to basically shoo off a bunch of outrage merchants who were just completely wrong about the game and were assuming it was like a completely different game on a completely different engine and just clearly did not know what the hell they were talking about, and she had to, you know, deal with that for a while. The cosplay video uh, seems like kind of a one-off thing. It seems like it kind of came out of the blue with the channel, and it kind of did. Like I mentioned in that video, it was something that I was working on for about two years, like off and on, like writing bits of the script for it and revising the script and going back and rewriting things. But I, I finally got the motivation to, to just buckle down and finish it. And it is one of my favorite videos I've ever made in terms of, I think in terms of the quality of the script and the substance of what I'm saying, it's the best video I've ever made. In terms of the production quality, it could have been a lot better. Obviously, a lot of that is being recorded with the on the uh, mic attachment to the top of the camera, so it, the audio is not very good, and I should have framed the camera better, uh, did better lighting with that. But in terms of the substance of the video essay, I think the cosplay video is one of the best videos I ever made, even if the production quality is like a 5 or a 6 out of 10. Um that video didn't get as much reception as I was hoping for. Like, I, I wish it did better in terms of views. That style of video of doing, like, a a true and honest video essay, like how the people I take inspiration from have done, it makes me want to do a lot more, you know, pseudo-documentary style, long-form video essays like that. And I have a couple of ideas. Um, I, I do want to do a documentary style video on uh, game collecting. And not just like how game, like what it's like to be a collector, what it's like to collect for certain systems, but then segue that into how collecting has changed over the years and how post COVID late stage capitalism has made, has just in shitified the process of collecting anything, especially collecting games. And then segue that into talking about like, the ethics behind collecting something and, you know, maybe tie that all into like a, a con general condemnation of the modern gaming industry. Um, and so I can, I can see that being like a multi hour long video, but I'm just very indecisive right now of how much of that I want to include. I've been writing parts of the script of that, but I, I'm torn between having it being like a complete saga of my entire experience with video games as a kid until now. Um, or if that's just going to be a bunch of boring stuff that nobody cares about because it's too personal. Um, or And I just want to focus on the collecting aspect of it. But I have... I've been saving so many screenshots of so many articles about whether it's like a studio getting shut down or mass layoffs or a live service game that just got shut down or a way in which interacting with video games has become so anti-consumer and so hostile 
and it sucks for everybody. It sucks for it sucks for developers. It sucks for retailers. It sucks for for consumers. It sucks for everybody except for the executives at the top. They get to like double their personal take home revenue while everybody else suffers. And I just there's a lot to be said in that. But I don't know if I should tie that into a video about collecting because I'm tempted also to make other random collection videos because I, I one video I actually am tempted to work on uh, very soon within the next few months is just like a little post-mortem on the PlayStation Vita and talk about what it's like to own the Vita and some of the best games for it and kind of dispel a lot of the negativity and uh pessimism that was directed at the vita when it was new and why it you know because everybody knows why it flopped like i don't really have to talk about that i want to talk about it in a very positive way and talk about you know what does owning and collecting for a vita look like right now this day and age compared to what it was like to buy it as a consumer electronics you know gadget back in 2012 2013 so you know i don't I either want to make a bunch of individual videos, you know, like a uh, what it's like to collect for the Vita, what it's like to collect for this, collect for that, um, or to make just one big video essay that's like, here's what it's like to collect for all these things, here's what collecting culture is like, here's how it's changed, and then, oops, it sucks now because COVID happened and we didn't we didn't uh, pump the brakes on capitalism. Capitalism got worse and made everything worse for everybody except for the people at the top. And uh, what do we do about that? Um, the answer is pirate games. Um, uh, anyway, so I'm, let me know what you guys think about that. I'm just not sure what direction I want to go with, with that, but we will, um, we'll see. I, I'm also tempted to start uploading other random cosplay videos to the channel. Um, you know, back in the day, especially when I first started on YouTube, talking about like back in the Let's Play days. I was, I think I was kind of just ashamed of my nerdiness when putting myself out there as like an internet persona where I want, I, I guess I wanted to be perceived as more of a normie than I was and didn't fully embrace the cringe. And I should have, I should have just been unapas unapologetically passionately nerdy because nobody cares, right? And I it could be worse. Like uh, I you know, like I collect video games and build model kits and collect old toys and dress up as fictional characters and go to anime conventions and sci-fi conventions and all that. But I've got my life together. You know, I've got a great career and I've got a I've got a wife and I I got a house and you know, all of my my family's basic needs are met. So there's nothing to be ashamed of in being a huge dork and a nerd. And um, so. I am like what you know in the in nowadays I'm like should I just you know tie everything that I'm into together on the channel and be like yeah let's make some more cosplay videos and make a video that's like a lot of the projects I'm working on right now are rebuilding older things from uh, from scratch like re rebuilding parts of old cosplays and with uh, newer better construction methods and materials so they look better look nicer fit better. And so I kind of want to make a video, like a build documentary of each of these new cosplays. And it won't be like, hey, I made this piece today and then upload the whole video about like just the one chapter. It would be like I start filming now and then like six months later when the build is done, I have a complete video. And so it's just like I'm taking a little bit of B-roll here and there every time I make progress on the project. So it's not a video that needs to be done with any amount of urgency or a um timeline or anything it's just something fun i wanted to do so let me know let me know if you guys would like to see that and it would it wouldn't really again it wouldn't get in the way of the main channel video essays because it i'm going to be working on that stuff on the side anyway like i juggle a lot of hobbies and i juggle a lot of social activities if i didn't do that i could commit harder to making video essays but I'm very, very happy right now with the balance that I have struck. I've been able to equally balance my career, my social life with my wife and our best friends, and making videos and just casually playing games this year. I've been able to just like kind of equally keep all those balls juggled in the air, and I'm just very, very happy with where I'm at with that. And I'm not going to compromise on that more just to be able to make videos faster. I'm, I'm pretty happy with the like... You know, if I can maintain the one video a month pace 
with the level of quality the videos are currently at, I think I'll be okay. Um, so finally, I guess it's uh, going to talk about what is next for the other two channels. So for those of you that don't know, again, just to clarify, like I mentioned earlier, my original channel that I started in like 2007 was rebranded into Starcross Soul Zoids. And that channel has like 3.5-ish thousand subscribers, has more subscribers than this channel does because there is a loyal following for, for Zoids. And that channel is dedicated to making content about model kits, particularly Zoids, and talking about the Zoids lore, talking about the Zoids video games. And the output of videos for that channel is slowing down, and I wish that it wasn't, but I just haven't had as much motivation to, to talk about Zoids. There are some videos about some Zoids games I need to make and soon, but the output of videos about model kits is going to slow down because the only model kits I have left to talk about are ones that take a very, very long time to build, like sometimes 12 or 14 hours to build. And so I need to find time within all these other projects to go and build a new one. And I'm not the kind of whale buyer collector for any of my hobbies where I'm going to spend like outrageous amounts of money buying piles and piles of these things to review like every day. I'm just not, I'm just not going to be like that. And so there's an upper limit to how much space I have in my house to put random money wasting hobby stuff. And so I'm not going to be able to continue to make videos on model kits forever. Um, but I will try to continue to up, update the Zoid channel because that one, it, it deserves the most attention and, and focus because it is the one with the, by far, the nicest and most loyal fan base. Like almost every comment I get on the Zoids videos is positive. People really appreciate what I do there. And so it only makes sense to continue to do that. But the output of videos for that channel has slowed down exponentially as I've been focusing more on main channel content and other, you know, hobbies and projects in real life. So, but I will continue to make videos for that channel, even if it ends up being like maybe one or two um, model kit reviews every month or every other month. Um, I may no longer do videos on the Transformers kits on that channel because the reception to that was uh, lukewarm at best. I think people were like, hey, there's already enough people talking about Transformers out there. We want to hear you talk about Zoids. Um, nobody has outright said that, but that's very much the impression I get by the reception of the Transformers videos on that channel. So um, we'll see. If I do continue to make videos about Transformers kits and toys on that channel, it's very much just going to be a, a personal uh, labor of love because there there's no motivation of growth there because nobody really interacts with those videos on the scale they do with the Zoids videos. Um, finally, I have a third channel, which is dedicated to the Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG. I made this channel um, maybe two years ago. I'm not 100% sure at this point. And um, I was really happy with where that channel was at uh, late last year because I was making these long form videos that were like these comprehensive tutorials on how to learn a particular deck, a particular strategy. And they were supposed to be somewhat future proofed, but I, I could never have anticipated what, how the game has changed in like the last like six months. And I, from the beginning of this year until now, I've been pretty unhappy with the game. Uh, for those of you that don't know or don't keep up with the Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG and maybe you don't care about this, but the best deck in the room by far has been a deck that costs about like $1,000 on the secondary market to be able to buy all the cards for it. The degree to which power levels have changed in the last like six months has made a lot of stuff that was like semi-competitive that I could play completely irrelevant. And then there were bans and limits to decks that I was going to make primers on, tutorials on, like I was going to talk about Infernoble, and then they banned a soul day. I was going to talk about plants, and they limited uh, Sunvine or Sun Avalon Dryas and everything. And so uh, that pretty much, I had plans. Like I was in the process of working on the deck primer for Infernoble when they banned a soul day. So anything going on with the Yu Gi Oh channel has basically grinded to a halt. For that, and it kind of makes me just want to focus my efforts over there on alternate format content like Goat, Edison, Speed Duels, and Common Charity, because I know those are at least somewhat future proofed. 
and are not as susceptible to disruption as the current competitive format, but we'll see. I just, I have not wanted to even think about the TCG since, since like December, January. And, um, I am getting a little bit back into it. I did some deck building over the last week and I am almost at the point where I can play the, um, Tenpai Dragon deck because I found out that I not only had two Trident Dragons, I had three, <laughs> which means I can definitely play Ten Pie Dragons. The other thing was like my locals, I love them to death. Uh, Hawks Nest Gaming just canceled that they're 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 no longer doing their their Rogue Knight, uh, where they play kind of off the current meta format. They play like a, at a power level slightly below that. And that was really ap- appealing for me, my wife, and our best friend to go with me up there to play in an environment that's not super hostile and super competitive. And the fact that they have taken that away makes me very discouraged to want to play. Um, but to to head all this off of the past and to kind of move on with this video, um, I will make more content for the Yu-Gi-Oh! channel eventually, but I'm definitely appreciating the break to just kind of focus on the main channel. So... I think that about does it. Um, let me know what you guys think. And uh, if you guys have any questions or comments about those new those future projects coming up, or if you guys want to see me go a particular way with that collecting documentary, let me know. Um, this has been a lot of fun. I really enjoyed this a lot. There's been some ups and downs, but I'm extremely grateful for what we have. Um, and I'm, above all, just extremely grateful that I have the support of my wife and our community of friends and i i love my wife and our friends so much and uh being able to experience these these interests and these hobbies with them whether it's video games or cosplay and everything has definitely been a massive highlight of the last couple of years so um here's to the next thousand subscribers or however many I can get before I get burned out and don't want to do this anymore. And hopefully by that time I will have made every video that I just talked about. So thank you guys so much for watching and we'll see you next time.